All right, James, so we're back, of course, talk about some FF7 Rebirth. We're going to look at some more translations from the Ultimania. It's been a while. I've been intentionally kind of putting it off because translations have slowed down significantly, mostly because people kind of cover the major aspects of the Ultimania. Uh, so I want to let kind of a bunch of translations build up so that we could look at a bunch. Otherwise, these videos would be quite short. As always, let's just hop right into it. At the time of Remake's Ultimania, Nomura was struggling to figure out how many parts they should make. They'd started the project with the feeling that it might be a trilogy, but after the first game was done, Katase suddenly said, yeah, we should make this a two-parter. Since you'll have a multi-year gap between each entry, going the trilogy route would make fans wait out that gap twice. To avoid that, he wanted to end things with the second part. However, Katase says packing all that in the second game would have made it quite huge. So this by itself, I don't think it's like new information. I feel like we've heard this before, that they considered doing two parts at one point. I don't know if we had specifics on it, like that it was Katase who was suggesting it. I don't know. Which is kind of weird, because we get that a lot from like interviews and stuff, that like Katase, I think, is the one that was trying to mix it up with the remake project right instead of doing a trilogy which was the you know initial idea for the remake project he wanted to do a two-parter and then he's the one that was suggesting doing like new shit as opposed to like you know namora being the one that actually wanted to dial it back and keep it like closer to ff7 original but it always amazes me to hear about the them considering doing a two-parter after remake because like i don't know what part of remake made them think that they could squeeze the rest of the ff7 story into a second part if they're trying to keep on track with what they did with remake where they expanded you know story elements and shit it'd be practically impossible unless it was just a absolutely massive game and they certainly couldn't have done it in the time it took for rebirth to come out right but unless they like cut back significantly on what they did with rebirth to squeeze in the rest of the ff7 story like the world size like the regions would have been significantly smaller more linear you have to cut back on like side quests and mini games in each like region and location and chapter or whatever and chapter length would have been significantly reduced, or at least the story elements would have been more fast-paced if they're trying to squeeze in the rest of the Final Fantasy VII story. I will say, though, that I can respect Kitase wanting to do that for the fans, though, like, because the fans have to wait, like, twice, right, for the second part, then the third part, like, that's why he wanted to do a two-parter, and I can kind of respect that, but the game would have been worse because of it. FF7 Rebirth content programmer Ryota Nishizawa says Moogle Mischief was initially intended to fall in the footsteps of Mog House from the OG, and be a way to illustrate Moogle's cuteness. However, it eventually turned into a game where they pull mean pranks on you. I'll be completely honest, when it comes to the Mog House game from the original FF7, I don't have any particular attachment to it. It's iconic for what it is because it's so unique looking and so different to the other mini games there. But it's not like a fun game to play, whereas like, if you're good at it, like the snowboarding can be fun, the bike racing's fun, the submarine game can be kind of fun, I guess, and so on and so forth, right? It's not much of a mini game to Mog House, so them wanting to bring that back would have been kind of weird, unless they changed it up entirely, made it more fun. And I personally like the mini game that we have for the Moogles with Rebirth, uh, even though it's not like complicated, which some people have. I've seen that said on social media since Rebirth came out, like people complain about how difficult the mini game is, which I find strange because, like, I think I've beaten it on all the difficulties, or whatever, with like a good amount of time left, because it's not you don't have to run and pick the Moogles up because you can just run at them and they'll run the opposite direction. So just run at them towards the tree, make them run themselves to the tree to, like, capture them or whatever, right? I don't know. I just people complain. I think, like, it's one of the easiest mini games in all of Rebirth, for sure. Ikawa highlights the joy of sequels in reuniting with familiar characters, ensuring the inclusion of those from both the OG and Remake. Nojima's scenario also focused on the theme of forming connections, leading them to deepen relationships with minor characters, too. This was definitely something I did like about Rebirth, is as we're traveling the world, you're running into, like, you know, kind of minor sort of important characters that you met in Remake, like, you know, Madame M and Andrea and stuff like that, and Jules, we see him again at the gym around the Krill area. I do like that. It's, it's kind of cool, because people are going to have their favorites, characters that they like, so it'd be cool to see them again, potentially, in Rebirth. Beck's Badasses are a good example, right? They were, like, really funny characters in Remake, and they're, you know, equally as funny in Rebirth, so it's good to see them again. I will say it's a very slightly, just ever so slightly, and this is just me being, looking too much into shit, like, ever so slightly kind of immersion-breaking that all these people that we know from Remake that were in Midgar just happen to be traveling the world the same time as us. Some of them are ahead of us. They're already in locations that we arrive at at some point. So, like, it's, it's not the biggest deal. It's not ruining my experience. It's just one of those things that I think of when I'm playing a game, and I'm wondering if they're going to be doing that in the third game. Are we going to run into Jules again? There's a new workout mini game. Are we probably going to run into, like, Beck's Badasses again in the third game at some point? Probably, because... They're still bad guys by the end of their, like, little arc in Rebirth, right? So, as we start, like, traveling to, like, newer locations in the third game, are we going to be running into people that we already ran into in Remake, and then already ran into in Rebirth, and they just happen to be at these locations we're traveling to in the third game, that kind of shit. Obviously, with Shinar's tweet, they used a picture of Chadley, and Chadley's kind of a controversial character after Rebirth, right? Because with Remake, I don't think people had much of an opinion on him, because he's just, like, a very small character. You get some, you know, side content from him. There's a little bit of story there if you do all of the, you know simulation shit with him or whatever 
But with Rebirth, he's like attached to damn near everything you do. And I just, he wasn't that good of a character for me with the remake that I wanted that from him for Rebirth. And going into the third game, we've talked about it a lot, but I just don't want, you know, as much chatting in the third game. And hopefully they dial it back a bit. FF7 Rebirth lead battle programmer Satoru Koyama says that during remix development, that a bug where characters inflicted with frog would stand and pose like humans, because Rebirth modified how the frog status is handled, the same bug popped up once again. This picture is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen, and I absolutely love it, and I want them to modify the frog status element in the third game to where it looks like this, where we stand upright and fight like anthropomorphic frogs. FF7 Rebirth lead animation and cutscene programmer Ryo Hara says that outside of cutscenes, the game makes wide use of AI-generated lip-sync movements. While Remake generated these via phonic analysis, Rebirth used an AI train on cutscenes from the previous game. See, this right here, this is good use of AI, right? Because we know Square Enix is always trying to venture into, like, whatever's the new hot thing, NFTs, blockchain, AI, whatever, whatever. This is kind of cool. Like, I'll say lip-syncing doesn't really bother me too much. I understand that it's a game made by Japanese developers made in Japanese usually. I think with Rebirth though, they did specifically try to make it like more English focused, I think with like the lip, lip syncing, at least I guess in cutscenes. but using like the AI outside of it to make like the lip syncing match with the characters are saying maybe in all the languages potentially that the game comes in. That's kind of cool. It is, I am somebody that kind of complains about lack of immersion. I kind of understand the limitations to a certain degree. If like you can't make like the lips match what they're saying in a different language in English or whatever, that's fine. But if they have AI uses for that, that's pretty cool. Uh, going forward, though, I'll say with, like, AI, I just don't want, like, you know, developers to lean too heavily on that shit. Like, uh, like auto-generating, like, locations and dialogue and characters and quests and things like that, where it's just, you can feel like there's no heart in it, which is something I'm a little worried about, because it is Square Enix. FF7 Rebirth Animation and Cutscene Programmer Atsushi Tawara says that because the Tiny Bronco shares most of its movement programming with the character models, it can technically move on land, which he was alarmed to find happening near the end of development. So yet again, something else I want to see in the third game, right? If it can drive on land, like, behind the scenes, why not just make that a thing? We You could almost have, like, a permanent buggy, right? Instead of having it strictly for the Krell region, just have the Tiny Bronco driving on land. I don't know how it would make any sense. I don't know how you'd realistically turn it, because obviously planes and shit drive differently than actual vehicles. Uh, but, I mean, it is Sid, he's like, you know, a mechanic and shit, he knows what he's doing with those kinds of vehicles, maybe he could just say, I fixed it, where I could drive on land. And we'd have, like, a literally all-purpose vehicle, it can fly, it can drive on water, it can drive on land. I guess I would get rid of the high wind, but still. Speaking of, which, and speaking of which, actually, we do see, like, Sid fixing the tiny Bronco at the end of Rebirth. I wonder what the point of that is. Like, obviously, we might need to use it to a certain point until we get the high wind, but if, like, I wonder if the tiny Bronco is going to get, like, destroyed or fucked up in the third game to where we have to use the high wind because like it seems like it's fixed at the end of the game ff7 rebirth lead rendering programmer shuichi ikeda says the rendering code had to be totally rewritten after remake the ps5's performance boost went to improving the frame rate with nothing left to allocate elsewhere so if rendering looks the same then that's a win so i guess i'm gonna explain why rebirth looks worse than remake in kind of a lot of cases i think there are aspects of rebirth that do look better but most of the time, it's something we've talked about since, like, the demo and then, obviously, the full game. Just, like, character models aren't as good as they were with Remake and stuff like that. And maybe this is why, because they had to completely rewrite the rendering code with Rebirth, which sucks. But overall, the game does look good. It's just, like, lighting issues and, like, shadows and character models sometimes. FF7 Rebirth co-director Toriyama says that during the scene where Zack is in the church after the final battle, we don't see a depiction of Loyal Little Stamp. He says in that scene only, it is still not revealed what world it is. Now, I'm pretty sure we've read this before from, I think, maybe Audrey's translations that she did. Uh, obviously, we don't know what world Zack's in at the end. I think, given that we don't know, it's either a world we've yet to see, like the potential, like, sixth or seventh world, whatever, how many worlds there are, timelines, whatever terms you want to use, or he's in Beagle, because otherwise, what's the point of keeping it vague, right? If there'd be no point in hiding what world he's in or making a big deal about what world is Zack in at the end of the game, unless it was going to be a brand new world, what the significance of that would be, I don't know. Or him being a part of our main group's world. And if he's a part of Big World, it means he's alive, right? And it's not an impossibility. Sephiroth came to life, came back to life with uh, avid children, right? Now, how does somebody who's not Sephiroth and not have this like really strong connection to Genova able to come back to life? I don't know how to do it, but I mean, it's not impossible, right? And we know with like the lore, the compilation up to like avid children, which is years after FF7, Zack and Aerith aren't fully in a part of the live stream, right? Because they talk and interact with Cloud. I think it's entirely possible that so far Zack's been dead up to like the end of Rebirth and maybe comes back to life. By who? By how? I don't know. The planet, Aerith, maybe Sephiroth for some reason. 
maybe Minerva, if she's in the lore, she's like the god of the planet or whatever the fuck, right? Like, it, it, the Whispers, maybe, I don't know. The Whispers saved Barrett's life in remakes, so who's to say that one of the versions of the Whispers, the white ones, black ones, whatever, could maybe bring Zack back to life, right? Even if it's temporary, it could be like a Tita situation, like we've talked about before in the past, where, like, maybe he's back to life, but not, like, fully. Maybe he's on, like, a temporary thing, like, he can only be alive for so long type shit to help our group save the planet, right? And, and then they gave him and... Sephiroth, you know, combat shit in Rebirth, right? Like, why would you give Zack an entire, like, combat mechanic and all these different moves and his own unique shit if it's not going to matter in the third game, right? The reason why I think all that, though, is just because of, like, all the different world hopping we see him doing in Rebirth. Like, I can't imagine we're going to be doing that again in the third game. I just feel like there's going to be a more focused kind of story thing for Zack. There's going to be more Zack going to the third game, obviously. I think we're going to be controlling him and fighting with him again. I don't know in what capacity, though. Is he alive? Is he dead? Is he in the live stream? That remains to be seen, I guess. FF7 Rebirth lead technical programmer Tomohito Hana, I'm reading a lot of new names today, says that although Unreal Engine 4 was the primary game engine used to produce FF7 Rebirth, the team also made an effort to incorporate some useful functionality from Unreal Engine 5. Admittedly, I don't know a lot about game development. In fact, I don't know that much at all, I would say. <laughs> but I believe with Unreal, you can kind of like plug in your previous works from like an earlier version of Unreal into like newer versions. So like Unreal Engine 4 should end Unreal Engine 5. Simply is as simple as game development can be, I guess. So I wonder if they're going to be using like Unreal Engine 5 more or kind of overall going into like the third game. Because they're still not like really making the game yet, right? They're still like writing it as far as I'm aware from what we've kind of looked at in previous interviews and shit and translations. Obviously, if they want to incorporate like the newest version of Unreal into the third game, then the third game would be better for it, right? Which I think is great. Like that means we might be getting like potentially the best of the remake project with the third game if they're using Unreal Engine 5. As about the kiss at the end of Tifa's day, Toriyama says that something fans have only been able to imagine until now, so they carefully considered how explicitly they could depict the visuals. He also says he felt a little embarrassed watching it as an older man. Shit, I ain't embarrassed. I'm trying to see more, actually. I'm trying to see some Under the High Wind type shit. Yeah, Cloud and Tifa kissing in Rebirth is something I was kind of hopeful for. It's something I actually tweeted about last year and I think sometime before then as well. Coming off the hills is like 16, like the depicted, I think, Clive and Jill's relationship pretty well. And not just because they have sex, which was great to finally see in like a Final Fantasy game, right? Uh, but like I wanted them to at least go into like the realm of kissing at the very least. Something, just depicting romance finally. Because we, we do have it a decent amount in the Final Fantasy series, but it's not all the time. Like Final Fantasy X has it, 13 has it, 15 has it. And there's probably some others I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. But we've seen it a few times here and there where, like, you have, like, couples actually kissing. And in 13, it wasn't even, like, lightning. It wasn't the main character, right? It was, like, Snow and Sarah or whatever. But yeah, it's finally cool to see, right? Cloud and Tifa kissing. Because uh, it's always been Cloud Tifa. It's always been Zack Aerith. It's not to say that you can't, like, Cloud and Aerith can't have feelings for each other. Because they do, obviously. But in terms of, like, relationships, who they're going to be with, who they're meant to be with, Cloud Tifa, Zack Aerith. And it obviously will never put an end to the, the shipping bullshit. I mean... They could show full-on penetration between Cloud and Tifa, and people would be sitting on the sidelines arguing, well, he's only doing it because Aerith's not there. Like, that's that type of shit the shipping community is always on. But obviously, if you pay attention to the lore, outside of just the original FF7 and whatever Maiden is, like, it, it's always been those couples, right? And I've wanted them to, like, lean into that with the remake project, and they finally are. We got Actually, with Cloud and Tifa, it's more than just the date, because they almost kiss in Gangaga earlier in the game, too, right? Like, they're about to kiss, and then people kind of come through the door and, like, interrupt it or whatever, so... Even earlier in the game, before we get to the date scene, they're kind of leaning into the fact that they're interested in each other. Since we had a kiss between Cloud and Tifa in Rebirth, I would almost bet money that we're going to get a kiss with Aerith and Zack in the third game. Whether that's IRL, like if they're alive somehow, or if it's in the live stream, they're going to show it. I almost guarantee it. And to be perfectly honest, like I love the love interest shit in RPGs, but the Final Fantasy series. You know, growing up I, with FF7, I loved you know make, doing the nice options for Tifa, so that like Tifa and Cloud ended up on the date together. In Final Fantasy VIII, I was always trying to be nice to Renoa for Squall because I wanted them to like get together. In Final Fantasy X, even though there's not a lot of choices in that game or whatever, so much. I obviously love the relationship of you know Titus and Yuna, and at the end of the game when she says "I love you," even though that's not what she says in Japanese, that shit still hits, man interject real quick too like i'm aware there are actually choices in 10 there's like a, its own kind of affection system that affects certain scenes and things like that depending on how you answer questions and shit but it's not the same thing as like the dating in seven right you're not deciding who you're gonna go on a date with you're deciding who's gonna ride a fucking snowmobile later with you well that's it for the video though my dudes there's obviously other translations like recent ones we haven't read there's translations that go back weeks at this point that we've yet to read but in all translations that i feel like are video worthy we might still look at them at some point if we need to make a video a little bit longer right if it's we need to fill out some time a little bit so the videos aren't one or two translations long but i try to read the translations that are at least a little bit interesting to me or seem like new information to me something we could actually talk about etc etc anyways that's the video drop the channel if you guys are new social networks in the description below follow me on twitter dash david that's it bye <laughs>
Used to care what people thought, but now I care more. And nobody out here's got it figured out. So therefore, I've lost all hope of a happy ending. Depending on whether or not it's worth it. So insecure, no one's perfect. We spend it with no shame. We blow that like old train. We in here like low gain or leave it like old bang.